You know, what's interesting about working in public sector is we can all relate to it. So we're all citizens, we're all taxpayers, we use government services all the time. I find it quite addictive. The more you become involved and the more that you relate it to your own taxpayers' money, the more I feel linked to it. The money that is spent is our money, it's taxpayers' money, right? So it's really, really important that that is spent in the right way for the, for, for the, you know, for the better of this country and for, for UK citizens. Um, I won't say that there, there isn't waste going on. I mean, there's terrible waste of public money and I think that gets lost a lot of the time. The, the UK government um, announced a, a public cloud first strategy um, so that it could rapidly um, transform um, the way that they served UK citizens. I, I initially thought that it was, it was crazy. So my name's Steve Holt. Um, I work for a company called Infinity Point. We provide independent advice to, uh, to government, um, intelligence and law enforcement. Um, I come from um, a public sector background. I used to work at the Home Office and at the Ministry of Justice. It's quite, it's quite interesting. I mean, a, a lot of people decry public sector as kind of slow paced, really difficult to work in. But there's some aspects of it that you're, you're actually, you know, like especially in law enforcement places, there is threat to life and you're, you're dealing with kind of situations where if you get it wrong, then it could cause a serious problem. <laughs> so my name's Darren Howe. I'm the Deputy Director for a category called Digital Future within Crown Commercial Service. My civic duty is, is, is a huge passion I, and making sure that, that we are supporting and guiding um, in the right ways around emerging technologies, around future thinking technologies. What the, your, your average person in the UK wants is that when they are engaging with the health, the health services or social services, people want access to those services in exactly the same way that we would want to access Facebook or social media or shopping. We need access to services immediately and fast and in a way that sometimes we don't want to speak to people. So bringing public sector up to date and using technology to do that not only saves taxpayers money but makes the uh, services we provide and the public sector provide much more effective. So I'm Russell McDonald, I'm a strategic advisor for Hewlett Packard Enterprise Point Next Services. Uh, and I work mainly with customers in the public sector and central government. You know, public sector is an interesting place to be because solving the challenges that new policies bring means that you have to seek out new IT solutions. Um, and so if you think about some of the biggest departments like HMRC and DWP, who, who manage a lot of the, you know, the benefits and they're, they're the biggest transactional government departments, um, you've got technology there that is still in use today, which dates back to the 1980s, um, because they were early adopters of mainframe technology, which was the only technology at the time capable of solving challenges at that level, you know, the tens of millions of people, transactional level. Um, and because that technology worked, there was no need to change it. But now here we are, you know, 30 years later, and we still are dependent on those old technologies. So nearly a decade ago, the US government were the first to move to a cloud first policy. And the UK government followed suit quite soon afterwards in 2012, 2013. I think what led to that shift was wanting to provide better services to citizens to take advantage of the shifts in technology that the private sector had been doing for some time. It was all about the art of the possible. And there was much more focus on the fact that cloud is a, is a completely new IT paradigm. It works in a completely different way. It's not about racks and servers and virtual machines. It's about um, hyperscale. 
It's about how you can deliver new ways of computing, actually transform how you do your compute rather than where you do your compute. I'm Tracy Jessup and I'm the UK Parliament's Chief Digital and Information Officer. We now have 97% of our services are in the cloud. Um, in doing that, we started small. Uh, we started with uh, some infrastructure as a service, with some of our, our uh, least uh, contentious services. And we also discussed openly uh, with politicians and colleagues around the advantages and the disadvantages. You know, it's on the record in Parliament that there were concerns around the Patriot Act, uh, there were concerns around where storage would be, um, and all of those were addressed. And there, it's right that we thought about those things um, in a way that perhaps some other organisations didn't need to. But it didn't mean that we couldn't take a cloud-first journey. We just had to be very mindful of the way in which we did it. So my name is Alex Hilton and I am the Chief Executive of the Cloud Industry Forum. Uh, we're a UK-based IT trade body. We conduct research on behalf of our membership community. As far as the government's approach, I think, to this cloud-first policy, to be honest with you, what I think was driving that initially was cost. So it was seen as a big cost saving. This cloud thing is going to save us millions uh, in terms of our IT budgets. The reality is that's not really the case. So, you know, cloud is not about saving money. It is about flexibility, agility, and scalability. You know, those are the big things in there that organizations can adapt and make changes quickly on the fly uh, in an instant. And, you know, the example of that quite clearly is paramount at the moment, which is the COVID pandemic that we've been through where organizations have had to adapt and move incredibly quickly. You know, if we go back to one of the major drivers for Cloud First strategy was Treasury saying government spending too much money on IT, there are no economies of scale. So if we fast forward 10 years to today, largely government IT is still being procured the same way, which is capital purchases over three, five, seven year terms um, with depreciating assets. And what that means is that at, when you go to market, you have to be thinking about what's the maximum capacity I need to procure. And you need to buy that maximum capacity on day one. So that, that model means that you're paying the maximum amount of money on day one for an estimate of how much compute resource you're going to use. So of course, one of the major drivers for moving to cloud was that pay for what you use model. I think the cloud first policy initiated change in mindset, and I think that was necessary. I think it created uncertainty and a level of inertia. The, across the public sector, there has been a, a, a real change in attitude uh, to technology. I mean, um, if you go back sort of 20 years, um, you know, the, um, the sector was running most of its workloads on very proprietary um, uh, technology systems. You know, there was lots of lock-in. Technology is a great enabler for government, but at the same time, there's a kind of culture which is when things work, don't change them. Um, and you know that makes a lot of sense, you know, minimising change, um, but at the same time, you, technology is always changing, and so it creates a situation where I think government are always struggling to keep up with technological advancement, and you end up with this landscape of it's almost like a computer museum, of every technology from every decade is still in use today in government because they can't get off of those systems and they're completely reliant upon them. I think the, uh, the ambition was, I think, first to modernise um, and to, to enable that digitisation of lots of legacy processes. Um, and I think second, it was to be more economic um, and efficient compared to what's, what's going on kind of today. I think maybe that's got lost a bit. You know, I think now there's a massive drive to everything must be cloud, uh, you know, when some things are just not suitable still. Uh, there are certain secure applications um, and messages and communications which are just maybe never going to be appropriate to be put in a cloud environment and organisations will want to keep their arms around those quite closely. I 
the, so the cloud put the, so did the cloud first policy work? Well, I think it did to some extent. Um, no, no, I don't think it has worked. Um, I think there is just a lack of uh, a lack of user testing and understanding um, should have been undertaken before before such a policy was announced to the market. You could you could take it in two ways. Did it work that it caused a massive mindset shift um, away from legacy thinking? I think yes, yes, it, it did, and it's, it still is. Um, has it worked from a delivery point of view? I would say not particularly well. You know, I think um, I think when you look at um, the change in the, the way that UK citizens have been able to um, consume services. Um, from public sector entities over the last 10 years, undoubtedly things have got better. Um, and I think since, since the policy um, was announced, we've been and seen a, a change, a change in shift um, and a recognition that actually cloud first wasn't the right, the right stance to have. Probably more cloud enabled or cloud preferable, um, but not cloud first. I'm Martin Sharkey. I'm currently the, the, uh, one of the founding partners and CTO of Cloudcubed. Uh, I've been in the IT industry since about 1997. Um, spent the last 10 years doing mass migration for some of the largest government departments in the UK. Uh, when that policy first came out, I, I initially thought that it was, it was crazy because of the service that I was migrating at that point, which absolutely wasn't appropriate for Cloud. Um, but as cloud has become more and more secure, there are elements of services that I guess are more appropriate to land in cloud, but maybe there are elements of that service that equally need to remain on, on premise. Um, I, I think that policy has become much more accepted today, but there still remains the workloads, the mainframes, the mid-range platforms that are definitely um, really expensive to transform. Um, and, and will take significant investment and time to be able to move those to, into some cloud compatible format. I'm Henry Rex, I'm the Associate Director for Government and Health at Tech UK. So I'm Sue Daly, I'm Director of Technology and Innovation at Tech UK. I don't know if it'd be fair to say, but uh, certainly several members have said to me when the cloud first policy came out, it was very much viewed as not just cloud first, but public cloud only. I think across the public sector experiences did differ and of course that speaks to uh, the diversity that the public sector has, um, you know, from really huge departments and teams that support them to really quite small ones, non-departmental public bodies, etc, etc. Um, also I think it can be easy to forget ju just how diverse the public sector is, so it isn't one a team, one policy, and people were in very different places to start off with in what they were doing originally and how they did it. You know, some people would have outsourced already probably most of their data center capability to third party providers. Other people had never done that. So the journey itself was actually different, I think. Quite often unique, bespoke, novel architectures. It was almost like every government IT project was an opportunity for suppliers to think up a new way to deliver IT rather than use industry norms. And so you end up with this patchwork quilt of random technology that nobody supports anymore, nobody uses anymore apart from government. I think that the cloud first policy, it was a challenging policy in the public sector because it was asking uh, all of us to adopt really different ways of working um, and to an extent to take the pain of that because when you're trying to do that and you're learning uh, and you may not be able to get all of the right skilled people because everybody's trying to do the same thing you're also being asked by colleagues to keep service really up to make sure there aren't any problems etc 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 and actually of course not everything is going to work and I think maybe that early days understanding of that wasn't that developed it felt perhaps to people like oh you could just take these things and move them over here whereas in reality there's a lot more to it than that. There are significant challenges um, technology has changed dramatically um, and for those who were in technology um, positions 10, 20, 30 years ago um, 
what we see today is different. The, the level and requirements to, to educate, to develop, um, and really get an understanding of what new emerging technologies are happening, what that looks like. Um, but also wanting the, and desiring the change um, and looking to that, that cultural shift um, is critically important as well. So for me, there is a, a significant requirement on suppliers to be able to translate what they're doing, um, what that looks like, but also translate that into a language that public sector understands. Um, there's far too much in the way of, of supplier jargon, um, and there's also public sector jargon, and there needs to be a balanced ground, there needs to be a, a, a middle ground that's found between supplier and buyer, so everyone understands actually what does this emerging technology looks like. Um, and with that, I think that, that, again, for those who have been in, in technology 10, 20, 30 years, they can get up to speed quite quickly. But if we are still thinking the way we thought 10, 20, 30 years ago, unfortunately, that won't, that won't work moving forwards. So what kind of happens is you get this sprawl of stuff, this technologies and capabilities and services that are everywhere within an organisation, and cloud costs get out of control because they, they don't have the processes and they don't have the, um, the visibility and the understanding of what to do with those costs. So cloud then looks unaffordable, but then they've also potentially got where they've not managed to get in there completely. You've also got the legacy debt that's on-prem and you end up with this kind of bow wave of legacy debt that is unpatchable, um, you know, you've got huge amounts of um, critical services on it probably cost millions and millions to, to get out of it, the risk is high, and then you've also got a cloud platform or multiple cloud platforms where you don't really understand what you're doing in them and it's costing you lots of money. Now because of the move to public cloud, there's been a lack of investment in, in, in the legacy uh, and what you've got now is a situation where you have six, essentially two different operating models inside an organisation. So you'll have an operate, uh, operating model that works around the legacy, very sort of static, yeah, and then you've got this new agile um, operating model around the cloud, cloud environments. And the thing, the problem with that is that it does create tension. So I think if you go and ask any person who works in digital in a public sector client, you know, what, what's holding them back? They'll tell you it's the legacy, right? The challenges of, of ending up in this kind of unconsciously hybrid mode of operation, where it's really the worst of both worlds. You can't fully exploit the benefits of cloud but you can't fully modernise the traditional on-premise environment either. So then they, they have this trade-off of, do I fix what I've got, or do I try to, to continue with this, which is the cost of spiralling out of control and we don't know how, how to manage it. So you end up in this real nightmare area. And so there's a skills challenge, there's a finance challenge, there's an operating model challenge. How you manage systems on premises if you're an IT administrator is a very different set of skills from how you manage a cloud environment. Um, and this is really at the root of the unconsciously hybrid problem, is that if you placed all of your bets on moving everything to cloud because that's what the government strategy told you to do, but you can't move everything because those things are too old, too vulnerable, too expensive to move, you end up in this, well now I'm managing two IT environments and potentially I'm spending more than I thought I was going to spend and I don't have the skills to manage both of those environments. Do I feel there's a digital skills gap? A absolutely. And, and that's the case across every industry type that is not something that is unique to public sector um, and you know as the vendors push their messages and they want to utilize you know uh, more advanced technology we get into worlds like artificial intelligence and the internet of things and so forth then you know the needs to as much as they try to commoditize those products and they are genuinely commoditizing those products to make them simpler for organizations there's still um, you know, many organisations and many businesses still have a, a delay in terms of the technical capabilities of the people being able to get up to the speed they need to be. And frankly, in public sector, many organisations are just struggling to keep the lights on at the moment, okay? Uh, and that's a big part of it. You know, one of the big things that I believe cloud can deliver is just infrastructure management, infrastructure control. That's the kind of the base layer. That's where we started a dozen years ago. 
um, with these conversations. And what we've found in our research at Cloud Industry Forum now is that um, half of organizations are now running their cloud, their, sorry, their infrastructure on cloud-based services. Okay, so to differentiate that, the other half is still running their infrastructure on-premise. In the public sector, it's still a high percentage are running their infrastructure in an on-premise environment. So a lot of the government spend that's gone into this, public sector, our tax pounds that have gone into this, is actually coming you know, from our pockets to keep the services running. And it is down to, to the public sector and the supply chain to come together and actually understand what is the best for the taxpayer, because ultimately that's what, that's what we're trying to achieve here, which is savings for the taxpayer and a more sustainable future for, for society, for the planet and um, for the economy. I won't say that there, there isn't waste going on. I mean, there's terrible waste of public money and I think that gets lost a lot of the time. Um, and it probably gets lost with a lot of both the, the public sector departments and the actual technology companies that are working to, you know, for, for those departments. But you always think about it. And um, you know, I've, I've been involved in some projects where um, it really comes to the fore where we've, you know, we've overspent in hundreds of millions of pounds and not achieved the outcome. So you, you, know, you do really feel a, a sense of, not so much shame, but you know, we've, not, we've not got to the, you know, to the part of the public outcome that is gonna benefit the citizens. But I think ultimately, you know, the challenge around um, the use of cloud technology is the costs can spiral. Uh, and this was the point I made right at the start. I think the government um, or, or the public sector, let's put it that way, at the start was saying, right, well, actually the cloud is our way out of getting you know really latest state-of-the-art technologies for a fraction of the price we were previously paying and that's really not the case. I think the other challenge is around funding models. So a, a lot of the public sector has a quite capital focused overall funding model um, and that's quite a traditional model and isn't really best suited to the cloud resource-based service-based model and that is still something I think that Treasury is working through with the Cabinet Office and although we are separate from that it's something that impacts us too so I think there's a big focus amongst my colleagues across certainly the government departments to work together to work with Treasury to think about how to alter the Green Book uh, and make sure that it can best meet uh, what's needed in the current cloud environment whilst also hitting everything it needs to around sort of transparency for the public and uh, indeed the Treasury. There's a fundamental disconnect between cloud first and um, another principle within government which is to reduce OPEX. You know, Capital funding, even all these big technology programs I've, I've been uh, involved in over probably the last 10 years, um, has always been CapEx funded with a very small OPEX kind of towel or budget to it. When essentially you're buying services, so they're OPEX based services, I see it all the time. Um, normally what tries to happen is that you'll go in and you'll be, buy something called a reserved instance. Essentially you say, right, I need 500 VMs those 500 VMs are going to cost a million pounds. Um, you know what, if I, if I reserve them over three years, that might be 250,000 pounds, and I'll pay for them up front, and then I'll try to take that out of my CapEx budget and kind of massage it as if it was a capital procurement. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work. But essentially, a lot of these fail because you've got the project budget, but you don't have the enterprise run budget, which is the OPEX services because cloud first that way, reduction of, of OPEX that way, just doesn't work, does it? Sustainability is hugely important in the sector. 
um, uh, particularly over the last 12 months, I've seen um, sort of sustainability and social value are the two the, the two buzzwords in the sector today, uh, and and rightly so. You know, the government set a really um, you know aggressive target, haven't they, around being um, uh, carbon neutral by 2050, and we're really starting to see that now in terms of the way customers are acting. Um, the way they want to consume new services and all the rest of it, you know, there's, there, every single tender that comes out now, um, there is a, 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 a huge amount of emphasis on on, on sustainability uh, and uh, and uh, a requirement for uh, technology vendors and suppliers to um, demonstrate their sustainable credentials in, 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 in not in, in not just in their solutions actually, but also in terms of how they operate as an organisation. I think the drive to work to a, a better sustainable position is there. Um, I, I'm aware of, of a number of different initiatives that are, are being um, rolled out. We're looking at a number of different um, public procurement notices that are driving better procurement practice around social value um, and also looking at emissions. Um, but I think there is still a need to educate. I think there's still a need to develop people thinking around sustainability. I talk often about um, the three principles of sustainability, so looking at the economy, looking at the environment and looking at society. I guess first of all it's very important to understand that digital technologies are not virtual, that the cloud is not virtual, that data centers are not virtual and so that all Everything that sits behind digital technologies, cloud-based solutions, on-prem data centers as well, is very material. And when we know that this is very material, we, we therefore can understand that there is an environmental impact that is associated in general with digital technologies. And so what happens at the intersection of both is really how can we, through the way we purchase, the way we consume, and the way we dispose of ICT, how can we reduce the environmental footprint of those assets? The downside is that by definition, hyperscalers are hyperscale. And so there are hundreds of thousands and millions of servers running all of the time, whether you're using them or not. So that idea that I can turn servers on and off when I'm using cloud, and that gets me a cost benefit because I'm only paying for what I use when I use it, that's great. But the underlying hardware that powers that virtual machine is still running when I've powered that virtual machine down because it's supporting lots of other customers. Moving from an on-prem solution to a public cloud solution, for example, literally just moves your emissions from what we would call scope one and scope two, which are in-house greenhouse gas emissions, to scope three, which are outsourced greenhouse gas emissions like your supply chain or like whatever happens uh, downstream of your own operations. And so from a very science driven perspective, moving from on-prem to cloud-based solutions is literally just moving your greenhouse gas, your numbers from one accounting column to another. And so it's not moving the problem at all, it's just putting this impact in the hands of another organization that you have less control on, essentially. Not all cloud providers are transparent about how renewable their energy consumption is. So you might get 40% of our um, data centers run on renewable energy. You might get 100% of our energy is renewable, but that's actually being achieved through offsets and not direct consumption of renewable energy. Some of the cloud providers have invested in wind farms and solar farms, which are uh, in the same region as their data centers. But that means it's a bit of a postcode lottery in terms of where are your workloads located in the world and where are the, where's the greenest energy in the world. Um, and in Europe, probably on balance, it's, it's in that kind of 30 to 40% renewable territory today. Sustainability is much broader than just environmental. You know, the discussion right now is really around you know, ESG, environmental, social governance issues. And that takes in issues around your supply chain, around 
not just the circular economy, not just energy usage, but issues around human rights and, you know, and supply chain issues there, but also much broader. And, and in my work, particularly around technologies such as AI, around how are we getting these technologies right from an, from an ethical point of view? So digital ethics, data ethics, how do we make sure that the technologies that we're using, not just to help the climate emergency, but to help public sector delivery, to help people in their everyday lives, to help you know, economic recovery, to help productivity, how do we use them in a way that remains important to have you know, human values at their core? How do we make sure we're using these tele technologies that in a responsible, ethical, transparent, way that means that they're accountable, the way that means that their decisions that are being made are challengeable, and how do we make sure that we use those technologies in a right way um, for people and society, not just the planet and not just our economy. I think what's important to understand the ICT sector uh, when we say that it's very much material, it's not virtual, is that we are in a sector that is driving already close to 5% of greenhouse gas emissions. Right? When the aviation industry, for example, is responsible for something like 2 to 3% of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. The thing is, the ICT sector is growing at a 8 to 10% growth in terms of greenhouse gas emissions as well. So not only we are still at a significant portion of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide, but we are as well uh, with a sector that is growing exponentially. You know, we, we need to cut our emissions if we want to follow if we want to follow science. We need to cut our greenhouse gas emissions by approximately fifty percent between uh, twenty twenty and twenty thirty. In twenty twenty, because of COVID, greenhouse gas emissions reduced by something like six to eight percent. So just imagine we actually need something like one COVID per year in order to meet our greenhouse gas emissions goals. And that is really showing how we need a systemic change. And so having a debate on whether we need to go to public cloud or on-prem or still in call, etc., is a false debate. And that's where the whole thing about focusing on behavior, on systemic change is important. And what happened in 2020 and the ridiculous reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that such a pandemic has driven versus what we have to achieve is really showing how we need to change behaviors and not necessarily the location of where your data center will sit. There is a responsibility on anyone that's uh, professionally, to use a horrible word, interfacing, anyone that's tangentially working with the public sector, supplying to the public sector, providing expertise, advice to the public sector, there is a responsibility, uh, a sense of civic duty to do your best. I think it's, it's important sometimes when we talk about, you know, for example, digital transformation in the public sector, we break it down into a, a series of processes, budgets, teams, functions, and it's always useful to sort of start the conversation by reflecting on the mission. Public sector transformation, what's that about? It's about the mission of the public sector. It's improving people's lives, it's protecting the vulnerable, it's taking care of society, keeping people safe, keeping people healthy, helping people to thrive professionally, personally, supporting families, educating children. And I think it's, it's always important to bear that, that mission of the public sector in mind, because of course, that's the lens through which the public sector view everything. And so every conversation you'll have as a, as a partner, as a supplier, whatever it is, is going to be informed by that sense of mission. And it does certainly, and I know both for us at Tech UK and for all our, our members and all the partners we work with, it's a, a really important part of what we do. You know, that, that sense of mission, that sense of purpose in, in helping, ideally, improve public service delivery. I definitely think there is a responsibility when working with the public sector, because technology is such a power for good it has so much it can offer, particularly in terms of public service delivery, that we need now, but also that we'll need in the future. But there's a responsibility because we have to get this right. So it's not just from a technical point of view, but from a social, from an ethical, from a legal point of view. All those issues have to be taken into consideration as well, so that we can use technology that is going to you know, be a real power for social good and a real power for change, 
but to do it in a way that is right for everybody and we bring everybody along with us on this journey. I think there's always a level of reluctance when you're thinking about how you change your strategy um, and whether you made the right decisions in the first instance. I think taking ownership is, is always a challenge. Human nature of taking ownership is always a challenge. Um, and I think that that is still um, transpires in the public sector. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing to, to accept that actually we made a, an incorrect decision. We drove and pushed for whether that's a cloud environment or a co-located environment and actually hasn't worked for us or it doesn't give us the benefits that we expected it to be. Um, and being able to go back to the drawing board and, and sort of rip up strategy and rip up a business plan and rip up a project plan and start again um, is probably in some cases the right way to, to move forwards. Um, and think about actually, what does the new world look like? Because I don't, I don't think there is an easy answer to this. We've got decades of technology that's still part and parcel of delivering services today. There's a lot that needs to change. There's a high mountain to climb in effect. Um, but the reality is that the technology exists today, the capabilities exist today to deliver transformational services anywhere so it doesn't have to be public cloud it can be in your own data center it can be in the uh, the mobile workspace you know there's no need for over provisioning there's no need for putting infrastructure on the, on the floor that you don't need today you know that's what's been happening in the past and that infrastructure uses a huge amount of energy you know so there's no need to do that now there are solutions out there now that allow you to, to be able to just have you know right size what you need, um, just have what, uh, and pay for only what you need. And I think everybody has landed on the idea that it is not black and white, that there are many shades of grey when it comes to cloud uh, computing, um, and that it's a and it's ex and it, it's an experience that you need to deliver. It's, it's all about doing, doing, doing what you need to do in the right place. You know, it's about, it's about if you need to do something at the edge, if it makes sense to do it at the, at the edge, then do it at the edge and, and, and consume it in the same way as you would if, if you were doing it in the public cloud. So it's about the right place for things, I think. There's no reason why the experience that um, organisations get uh, in the cloud can't exist at the edge or in the data centre. There's absolutely no reason for that. So the hybrid approach is about saying, you know, Where's the right place for that? You know, what's the what's from not just from a technology standpoint, but from a commercial standpoint as well. You know, there's a massive place for hybrid. Um, when I go to some of my clients, we look at their, their their strategy and we do that horizon scanning. A lot of it is that you want to get to where possible a certain levels of classification, a fully disaggregated set of services. I.e., I've got a device don't need an on-prem, I can go and consume my stuff within the cloud. However, the transitional move to that could be 10 years, you know, and there's always going to be a need for applications that have a certain sensitivity or built on certain technology that are just not suitable for the cloud. So hybrid is necessary. A lot of people don't understand why, and but you end up in this place. But if you plan it correctly, Absolutely, it's there. The benefits of hybrid, I think there are uh, numerous ones in there, but fundamentally what it would really boil down to is the flexibility uh, component uh, that, that I've talked about with what you know, cloud services can uh, deliver. Uh, you know, it's a stepping stone process. Some organizations ultimately will see themselves moving to 100% cloud utilization. Others never will, and that's fine. So that's the flexibility that hybrid offers, it is you know, finding your point in your timeline that goes, well, this is the journey we're on, and this is now the part that hybrid cloud can play in that. And I think that's really what it comes down to. It's, this is not complex in terms of being able to explain it. It's complex being able to implement it and implement it effectively, but I think as far as the explanation is concerned, it's really quite straightforward. Yeah, so when we describe being consciously hybrid, we're really just talking about being open to the idea that cloud computing technology can be delivered anywhere. That those capabilities exist today in any environment. And that we can, we need to set aside the kind of legacy thinking of IT in the past and just be open to the possibility that we can make it happen anywhere. 
you have to take a consciously hybrid approach. The, the, you know, the world has recognised that. Um, all of the ex most of the experts I speak, Gartner, will say to you that the world will be hybrid. There's a realisation that the world will be hybrid. Custom my customers are saying to me that that they recognise that some stuff won't go into the public cloud. So, if that's the case, and we'll, I think most people agree that that is the case then take a consciously hybrid approach in your approach to deploying new technology every time and make sure that one complements the other. Thank you.